Exit the car. So what follows is an introduction to the HR Art Archive uh, for people here who may be less familiar with it by way of a project that I am currently working on concerning a biennial event that ran from 1997 to 2008 in urban Bangkok in uh, the rural uh, Thai region, province, which I thought uh, which I thought uh, would be interesting to present in the context of the forum for the Lahore uh, Biennale. The work is still currently in progress and rather rough around the edges, so I welcome your feedback and comments uh, for dialogue. So, first of all, Gajor Art Archive. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with it, Gajor Art Archive is an, is an organization that was founded in 2000 in Hong Kong. Uh, and currently has uh, its main office still in Hong Kong, but also uh, an office in Delhi and in India, and also in Shanghai with a satellite space in um, New York in the US. And uh, the, is a, there are, is a library of books in Hong Kong, so what you're seeing here is a photograph of the library in our current space, um, and there's over 50,000 volumes in the library. So it's one of the largest collections of um, resources for research in contemporary, modern contemporary art in Asia. And was, when it was founded in 2000, it was really with the idea of addressing the kind of a lack or a need for further um, resources for people who were interested in contemporary art. Um, uh, uh, for resources in contemporary art in Asia. And since then, the collections have rapidly grown. So, this started off being a single kind of shelf, just really a shelf of uh, books, and it's grown over the years. Um, but in addition to that, there are also archival holdings. So um, what you see here is the physical vault uh, of material that is in the space. Um, but in addition to the kind of collecting of physical materials, there's actually quite a bit that exists online. So if you go to our website, aaa.org.hk, uh, you can see uh, the different sections. And actually, uh, when uh, AA began, it began with a team of researchers who worked on building collections, but also on filing reports. And so think back to a time before there was eFlux, before there was really even you know, websites that really uh, talked about what was happening in contemporary art, and this was kind of more meant to be filling in people on things as they were happening. So it was almost kind of like live reporting. It was part archiving, part reporting, right? And so we had researchers who would go to different cities across Asia and file reports. So you can see, for instance, um, this one is a photo log of a research trip that was uh, took place in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. So the researcher not only kind of had a, a brief text, but also various photographs uh, that were taken to give people a sense of what was happening uh, in that city at the time. And then also what kinds of documentation was happening uh, in these different cities. Um, and these were often part of trips where the researchers would also be collecting material that would be sent back to Hong Kong for archiving, for cataloging. Uh, to build the collections. And so there was this kind of the building of the library and the resources, but then also these kind of um, uh, reports that were filed. And then about 10 years ago, a switched kind of gears and began to build what are called research collections, which we may think of as um, archives, more properly speaking. In other words, they're not materials that necessarily originate with Asian Art Archive, but are sources that come from uh, archives that come from other um, sources. So in this case, you can see um, the first South Asia holding we had was the archive 
of Gita Kapoor and Vivan Sangram. And then that was followed by the broader collections. Um, so in that case, we have uh, the papers of four important artists, but also uh, artists and art historians who were important teachers at the University of Baroda, uh, fine arts faculty, and Kula Muhammad Sheikh, uh, Ratan Parimu, Kitri Subramanian, and Jyoti Bhatt. Since then, uh, we have continued to grow the collections, and so as um, as the car mentioned, we have collections now that include the archives of uh, Nilma, uh, Nilma Sheikh up here, but also Salima Hashmi here, um, and also uh, Rashi Arain, a small collection of material. I'll show you a little bit of that. Rotus Gallery, Mohab Jafar. Um, <clears throat> and also, uh, one Nilma Sheikh is the most recent collection, but the one before that is actually related to the autonomous women's movement in India. So related to performances of the um, Om Swaha, which took place in, from the late 1970s through the early 1980s, which kind of was a triggering point for uh, feminist, uh, autonomous feminist uh, protests in India. And uh, getting to the kind of um, what the collection actually looks like when you kind of click on it, you can see this is um, the Rashid Arin uh, collection. And um, even though it says no image is available, it doesn't mean that there's no, nothing to see. It just you have to click on it to get into the, the file. But you can see that the archive is set up so that there is what we call a tree structure, or basically a kind of a cataloging a system for the archive on the left-hand side and then uh, the files inside. And when you actually, oh, sorry. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, there's a switch up. So here, this is the Russian Iron, so you can see this is, the, um, this is the tree structure on the left here. And then you can see the images on the right. And when you click on it, then you get the enlarged image. So this is the outside of the Hayward Gallery where the exhibition took place in 1989. And then this is uh, the other story, a kind of a detail, with work by David Medallion, uh, which is in the middle here, and Yuanta, which is in the back. So both of them kind of um, spending, uh, artists who had spent uh, critical periods of their careers in the UK. Um, so now I'm going to go back to this, which is the Ray Longmanbach archive, sorry, got mixed up there. Um, so Ray Longmanbach is uh, a performance artist who is based in Southeast Asia uh, still today, and also someone who was an important chronicler or documenter of um, performance, as, uh, and also of street uh, protests, as it took place in Southeast Asia in the 1990s, primarily. And um, what you see in the, ar uh, in the archive are not just documentations of that he captured, but then also of various festivals and other kind of uh, exhibitions. So in this case, this is a documentation of Chiang Mai social installation, which took place in the mid-1990s. And uh, it's rather dark, but this is uh, uh, kind of a still from a video of Chiang Mai social installation. Between that. And then I'm showing you this, these are stills from um, the recording that um, Langenbach made of Brother Kane, which is widely considered a kind of um, very important um, performance that took place in Singapore in 1990, New Year's Eve 1993 1994, um, because it essentially was a performance that uh, was um, prosecuted by the Singaporean government and then led to the de facto ban on performance in Singapore for the subsequent decade but also kind of really kind of a turning point in the history of performance in Singapore in terms of galvanizing the community of artists in Singapore to kind of continue with the project despite the government um, ban. And uh, what's, what's great about the Longmanbach archive is it's, um, this is something which is very, very unique uh, in that there's not really uh, other recordings of the performance and we happen to have this and uh, it's available for people to consult. Back. And then, uh, so from that, I wanted to move into another collection uh, based in Southeast Asia, which is the Women Manifesto collection, which we are currently working on. It's something that um, 
began, well, the conversations began about 10 years ago, um, but then only really picked up again last year. And um, here you see the catalog for the first manifesto, uh, which took place in 1997, March on International Women's Day, 1997. Um, and along with photos of two, the two main organizers, Nitea Yori Oraku and Farshamir. Nitea uh, is a Thai artist, uh, and Farsha is an artist uh, who uh, was trained and educated at Baroda and actually um, moved around a bit and moved from the UK to Thailand to Bangkok right around the time that Manifesto was starting. And um, it was, the manifesto was uh, inspired by an earlier event which took place in 1995 called Travis Section. So if you think back to 1995, that was the kind of, that was the day of the um, International Women's Conference that took, that took place in Beijing, in China. And around that moment, there was a kind of a coming to consciousness uh, on the part of various uh, parties, NGOs, and women artists in Thailand. Um, to do a kind of a project looking at the situation of women artists in Thailand um, and also of sex workers. And so Travis Section was actually kind of um, organized around the theme of you know, working with um, sex workers in Bangkok, but then featuring only work by women artists. And then that led to a larger conversation, which then evolved into the manifesto, um, which was an exhibition uh, of women artists' work. And here we see one of those artists, uh, Hatha one Swan Eklut. So she was one of the organizers, Travis Section, who uh, had begun working on the manifesto, but then in the, before it opened, moved to Sydney, where she to, uh, is, continues to be based. And uh, the exhibition took place in two locations and featured 18 artists from nine countries. So I'm showing you some of the artists uh, in Thailand, and uh, K.O., who is an American, at that point was an American artist who had been based in Thailand for a while. Uh, this piece called uh, Arms for Sale, kind of a uh, pun, play on kind of the Akini figure, the multi-armed uh, deity figure. And then this uh, is one of the performances by um, a Tokyo-based artist. Kobayashi. And Tari Ito Self Portrait, uh, which uh, was a performance um, that uh, was considered rather shocking or received a kind of shock uh, reception in Thailand because it dealt with the question of, her, of the artist's lesbian uh, identity, uh, which was considered rather taboo. And then two years later, uh, Women Manifesto 2 took place. Um, and this time, whereas Women Manifesto 1 was rather um, kind of uh, small scale uh, and featured uh, support and was supported by a, a grant from the Japan Foundation, uh, the Women Manifesto 2 featured um, more robust support from the uh, Bangkok Metropolitan Authority. And uh, that meant t shirts and um, other things. Um, as well as the ability to host 30 artists this time, so it's a larger group of artists who made work uh, that was all located in the public setting of the park. So, on and on, from 1999. Yuvana, uh, relationship. So the artists essentially have one week. Um, originally, they had hoped to have two weeks to kind of, uh, the organizers hoped to have two weeks to set up, to give people proper time to set up the exhibition, and then also have time for something that would be more like a workshop or residency where artists would be able to speak with each other and kind of share it and um, exchange information. But because the funding didn't quite work out to being what um, they thought it would be, it was reduced to one week, and so it became rather rushed um, with the artist spending uh, quite a bit of time installing the work. But um, some, of it, some of which was rather um, complicated or 
complex. And this is Newtonian's fabrics. And for uh, Varsha, who collaborated with an Australian artist, Virginia Hilliard, her hands open and closes and opens and closes. Has dried one. So um, this is a detail of the work. There's actually a, a whole circle of these that are formed, and uh, um, it's rather poetic. This idea of feet that move but also are bound to each other, walking in a circle. And Nella Garzma, who's an artist based in Indonesia, from Pest to Pets, uh, which uh, featured all of these pelts that she um, collected from Indonesia, where squirrels were considered a pest. Uh, on the coconut plantations, and she brought them to this park in Bangkok where there were also squirrels, um, but which weren't considered pests, and so there was this kind of, you know, it was supposed to be about the juxtaposition of these um, dead pelts from the pests of the squirrels in Indonesia versus the live squirrels in this park in, uh, in Bangkok, which maybe were considered cute and cuddly. Oh, sorry. This one. Um, and another work from Keo. And Sanya Nivekovic. So what was interesting was that the, uh, the manifesto was able to feature uh, artists who were not just kind of uh, from Thailand and from the West, but also from other less expected uh, parts from uh, other parts of Asia, for instance, but also from Eastern Europe. So Sanya Nivekovic uh, is one of those. And in her work, she worked with artists who, uh, with women who were, um, eight women who were um, um, housed in double shelters. And so basically, um, who consented to work with her. And she made their masks, their face masks, but then also then had their stories. So you can see anecdotes uh, that were shown with the piece, with the masks, in this local setting. So there was a pavilion. So this was part of a larger project that Ivekovich had been uh, had been undertaking, and it was the second installment of that project. And then Mayumi Hamada uh, made a performance for the project, and then the, um, the of course because it was a kind of a large scale um, project that was sponsored by Bangkok uh, government. There was kind of a large gathering with um, group photos, and posters, and the aforementioned t-shirts. But in addition to that, there was, uh, despite the kind of the shortened timeline, there was time for uh, social gathering, and so you'll see some of that here. Uh, and that included kind of artist presentations amongst each other. So there was, beyond the exhibitionary component of uh, War Manifesto as a kind of project, there was always the idea that um, about the sharing and kind of learning from one another. So not purely kind of, you know, it's merely about the display of work or the making of work, but also something about more intangible, right? And uh, this is a photo of a gathering at the organizer's home. And in 2001, the, uh, the project then took a different turn where it essentially got rid of the exhibitionary component completely and became about the more um, workshop aspect. And so it left, the project didn't take place in, Thai, in Bangkok at all, but then took place at Boon uh, uh Farm, which was located in Isan, in the kind of north, northern Thailand. And so the invited artists all kind of took, uh, took leave of whatever we're doing, and there was no requirement that uh, okay. uh, this was the the uh, the built environment in which the artists were to be housed, and then uh, Nitaya making some weavings there. And even though there was definitely um, an introduction to the local crafts traditions. Uh, there was no requirement that artists actually make anything. Uh, there, in other words, there was no um, stipulation that they generate work. 
as part of this, even though many of them did. And it was much, as much about the exchange between the local residents with the artists and as it was between the artists themselves. And then in 2003, uh, so at this point, the fourth edition of the manifesto, it took another turn uh, when uh, Itaya became pregnant and so was unable to participate in the organization of uh, uh, the iteration of Manifesto. And so Varsha worked with Prina Nana, uh, who was one of the previous participants to organize um, a publication called Procreation Post-Creation, so inspired by Natalia's pregnancy. Um, and in addition to the publication, which you see uh, boxes, it was kind of a box edition that is displayed on the wall here, uh, along with these maps. There were also, uh, and here are the, here's the inside of the, kind of the cover, inside the box. That kind of makes clear the kind of the gynecological dimensions of the piece. And many of the artists contribute things that uh, uh, had to do with motherhood and reproduction. In, mother in very explicit ways sometimes. But there was also a launch party that was that took place um, featuring food, you can see here, uh, as well as perform uh, a variety of performances. So here, uh, Wandering Moon performance. And then in 2006, so a slightly longer gap, there was No Man's Land, which uh, took, took the form of an online publication or on website. And for that, uh, a, a fairly large number of artists were again. So Procreation, Post-Creation featured 88 contributors, and No Man's Land featured a slightly smaller number of artists uh, who contributed. Um, and it wasn't just women, uh, women artists, but also male artists who were invited to contribute as well. You can see um, one of them. Here's the website, what it looked like. Some details, different projects. And also uh, the contributions took different forms. So some of people contributed photographs, others um, texts. And this one, Tejo Shaw, I love, um, I love My India, which is a video piece. So relatively early work by Tejo Shaw, uh, which is interesting. So again, you know, I think one of the things that's really interesting about the manifesto as a project is that it's kind of a mix of different artists from different generations, but then on artists from different regions across Asia, in, in addition to other parts of the world, all kind of coming together. And then the last edition of Werner Fest to have, to have taken place in 2008 uh, was a five-week residency that, uh, with, again, was at the Bumbadar Farm in northern Thailand. And for this one, there were uh, eight artists uh, who were invited to participate. And uh, sometimes involved making making things. So there are in, indeed objects uh, that uh, have come out, that have come out of uh, the manifesto in 2008, the residency. So here you see some embroidery work. There was, quite a, there was an exhibition that took place last year, and so some of this was on display. Um, but what's interesting is in looking at the photo documentation that the manifesto, uh, the organizers generated amongst themselves, so they made these photo albums. There's really not an emphasis on the work that was made. It, it's almost as if it was a, about the kind of the communing, uh, communing uh, of these artists with each other and with the other people that really took precedence. And so, you know, that reflects in the kind of the snapshots that they took. Um, and also, there were various opportunities that were presented for uh, meeting locals. So there was open day with students coming to meet the, the residents. 
and then workshops with, uh, in this case, a tie-dye workshop with university students. And so really, you know, 2008 is kind of like as a, as something like um, a kind of um, a stopping point maybe, or a pause, was kind of thinking about what the manifesto had become up to that point and really kind of emphasizing it, uh, the, the kind of the social dimension of the biennial gathering rather than kind of using it as a platform for um, artists to display or show their work, right? Um, so at this point, I'm going to play the video. And I think this becomes clear uh, in the video documentation as well. And what's interesting about this is that all of this was taking place at a moment when there was, so the farm itself was not very far from the border with Cambodia. And right around the time of the uh, residency, there were tensions that were flaring up between Thailand and Cambodia. Um, and so this was kind of something which was happening at a moment when people were maybe um, a little concerned about that, anxious about that. Um, but despite this, this was kind of emphasizing kind of the unity of people to be able to come together. And so, you know, I think if there's a kind of pedagogical or kind of educational dimension to the manifesto as a, an event, there was also very much, um, it was meant to be a kind of an educational education for the participants themselves. And so, you know, the, the artists, um, uh, in this case, learning from the owner of the farm, who happened to be Nita's uh, then mother-in-law, who herself was very much involved with local craft traditions. And so there was this kind of exchange between the different participants um, as part of the one, one of the main functions. And um, I think that's particularly important when, it come, when you think about the kind of the international dimensions of World Manifesto. Uh, and at this point, I'd like to kind of turn to one of the participants uh, who uh, was involved with many of the iterations uh, of World Manifesto. And, uh, That is Nilfar Ahmed. Uh, 
who uh, participated from the uh, first iteration in 1997 until through uh, No Man's Land in 2006. So in other words, almost all of them except for the last uh, residency in 2008. Uh, so Nilifar at that point uh, uh, had been um, making work, so she was born in 1956 and uh, has been making work uh, since the 1980s. She was educated uh, in uh, Karachi and then at the NCA here in Lahore uh, before going to uh, the UK to continue her education, uh, where she was interested in first in sculpture, but then in painting, but then in sculpture again. And um, the, uh, the work that she made for the first uh, manifesto, unfortunately, we weren't able to find any documentation of that yet. Uh, but for the second one, she made this piece called Head Facing, 1999. And um, as with much of her work, it looks at issues related to the partition and kind of the diaspora um, that, that that entailed. And this is the piece that she contributed to um, the post-creation, uh, pro-creation, post-creation. Um, and the text says, wait, do not drop the veil. These silences are real voices hidden by threads. In New England, beefs, grotesque, bloody, macabre, catch them, twist them around. The truth has a tendency of revelation. And this is a detail of the image. And then for um, No Man's Land in 2006, uh, she uh, contributed this of documentation of performance that she did here in Lahore. And um, I think it was sponsored, the residency was maybe sponsored by Vassal. Yes, by Vassal. Um, and uh, featured her uh, wearing a, a garb composed of the American flag. And it was in protest of the US presence in, uh, in Pakistan and uh, in Lahore. And she was also wearing a mask over a head gear uh, that was a cage, um, and since uh, the artist happens to be present, maybe you can speak more about it after. But um, it's interesting, I think, to, there are different ways of thinking about um, the Bakun's contributions, and part of this maybe is thinking about the relation or the similarity between the work that she had been making at different moments. So I think, you know, head facing can certainly be thought of as along with the sculptural work that she was making at the time that wasn't shown at the manifesto. So on the left, a testimonial, and then on the right, um, Heads on Bed uh, from 2002, here. But at the same time, I think it's also interesting to think of this as a space where she was learning from other artists. Um, and so one of the things, that, one of the accounts from uh, Women Festo 2 that was really striking was um, talking about what she in, in experienced in learning from another of the artists, Ari Mayani, and the work that uh, Ari Mayani, uh, who's an Indonesian artist, made in regard to um, uh, violence against women. And at the end of the article, Akhmet points out that you know she had herself had experienced assault at the age of 10, but had never found a way to kind of um, come to terms with it. And that experience in the work of Ira Mayani in some ways allowed for kind of a rethinking of that. And so it's interesting to think of um, these kind of exchanges. Um, and this is a work by Akhmet, uh, one more recently from 2017. So continuities, but then also exchanges, you know, with Armagnani here, Abashanir, it's one of the organizers. Um, and I think this is an important point because it also, um, I think, allows us to rethink these questions of what exhibitions do and what these biennials do. Um, obviously, more recently, in the last uh, 15, 20 years, there's been a lot of scholarship about biennials, about exhibitions and exhibition histories, and how to think about contemporary art within those terms. But for the most part, that um, body of knowledge or scholarship is from kind of a Western perspective, right? Um, and so you, know, you see here the Biennial Reader, which is generated by the Biennial Foundation based in Europe, thinking about exhibitions. These are kind of two important um, compilations of anthologies of texts. But then also um, Biennials and Beyond, which is kind of uh, the second volume of a uh, two-part history of exhibitions across the 20th into the 21st century. Um, mostly Western, um, should be noted, 
and uh, the exhibitionist, which is a now defunct journal that you know was kind of very much focused on exhibitions and ex thinking about exhibition histories and exhibition theories, right? Um, but again, most of these thinking about it from a kind of a Western perspective, and so I think you know what we're hoping to do with projects like One Manifesto is kind of reintroduce um, material that can help rethink questions of exhibition histories from a non-Western perspective. Um, and this goes in, uh, uh, in tandem with other projects that A has been engaged in. So we are one of the co-publishers of um, After All's Exhibition History series. And the uh, last volume that was published is actually related to the Chiang Mai social installation. Uh, in other words, a series of exhibition or festivals that took place in Thailand uh, in the years leading up to a manifesto, and in fact, which uh, Nilo Varakov was a participant in, which then I think led to her participation in the manifesto. So it's thinking about a place like Thailand as being um, a possible hub for a global hub for contemporary art in the way that, say, you know, London or New York maybe is commonly thought of as being one of these hubs. And what does what does that mean for Thailand to be, or Bangkok, or you know, a farm in, in rural Thailand to be functioning as one of these hubs? How does that change the terms of that kind of function, right? And so this, these are kind of questions I think that a project like Women Festa brings up. Um, and also something that AA is doing is kind of mapping all of these exhibitions and all these projects. So um, when uh, we enter the information into our, the archive, we also trace the locations of where these events are taking place. And so you can actually lo locate them on a map and kind of do a chronological and geographical kind of you know um, filtering to see like what's happening at what point in time uh, and when. And so that kind of allows for a big data of rethinking of these histories as well. But anyway, I think I'll leave it there and um, open up for questions. Thanks. to contribute to, 
And so I think the idea is that, you know, just as you know, uh, there are now uh, vocabularies that are shared between different institutions so that, you know, there's um, a kind of a standardization and, uh, and assisting different organizations with being more inclusive in terms of, you know, the list of artists that make up this kind of long compilation of artists who matter or who get cataloged, right? Um, and how to deal with names and things like that. So in, the, in that way, this event database is something which can be you know, taken up by other organizations and kind of generating a larger database of um, exhibitions and performances and events. You know. So that's the first question. And hopefully that answers your question. OK. Um, and then the second question having to do with text versus images and audiovisual material, that's a really interesting and important question. Um, obviously, archives you know, for the longest time really dealt with only paper materials. And then I think, you know, beginning in the 19th, 20th century, we have, you know, like photographs and audiovisual materials. And I think it's been tricky for many institutions to work with them. Um, I think in some ways, the digital platform means that um, they all sit in some ways in the same way because they're all electronic files. But the way that you consult them is very different. Um, so, you know, in our case, texts are, are digitized as PDFs so that people can read them. Um, and uh, sometimes they're searchable texts, so people can kind of, you know, look through and find what, whatever keywords you're looking for. Um, images, on the other hand, are scanned as, you know, um, images, JPEGs, TIFFs, and, um, you know, audiovisual films or videos are, you know, uh, stored as uh, MP4s. And so they, you know, um, are accessible in very different ways. And as far as photographs go, they're stored in, um, each file is in a record, but a record can include multiple files. So in other words, um, if in the case of performance, we have someone who took 100 photographs of that performance, um, I, what you're doing now is putting all 100 photographs into one single record so people can rapidly scan across all of them and kind of understand the sequencing. And so it's not, it's not fetishizing each individual image as like it's, you know, an autonomous thing, but really thinking about the kind of the relationality between the images. And so that's one thing that we've implemented to kind of deal with the kind of, you know, the, the way that images can be generated in rapid succession now. Um, uh, as far as video goes, it's something that I think is still very, it's actually very cumbersome to deal with, to put online, to access. I think, you know, um, one of the things that um, certainly um, I never had to deal with when I was working with paper archives is thinking about how people would access the material. Because, you know, one of the things that people say about AA is, oh, it's great, you have it, it's on the website, anyone can access it. Um, and that's kind of true, except that, you know, working with an Asian context, you realize, for instance, in China, you can't access everything. A for, you know, fortunately for now, Hanwood, has not been a target of Chinese censorship. Um, but even when you don't have issues of government control, you also have to deal with just basic access, right? So even my colleagues in Delhi, oftentimes they have internet outages, or you know, their internet service just is not that great, right? And so um, making things available in a kind of accessible but useful way is can be a challenge because you want the files to be robust enough people can be able to see things, but not too big so that it will take like a day to Yeah, so there are two main reasons um, when we digitize a collection that things do not get placed on the website and they are made available on site only. One of them is for privacy reasons, so something may have confidential material that you know um, the, the donor of the material doesn't feel comfortable um, making available, broadly available online. Uh, and the other reason has to do with copyright. So for instance, if it's a newspaper clipping, um, that you know the copyright for which belongs to the newspaper, we can't just go ahead and put that online. We would have to get obtain permission. Um, and because given the quantity of material that we deal with, it's not always possible to obtain copyright for every single item in a digitized archive. So for that reason, there are some categories of material that we tend to just put offline. 
Um, so that includes correspondence, which you know can contain sensitive materials. So generally, we are more cautious about that, and so we don't make that available online. Um, and newspaper clippings and kind of other published material, unless you know it's kind of from a very clear source such as a donor, we tend not to make available online. So, but if a scholar wanted to consult, so if a scholar wanted to consult it, I think there are ways that they can contact us and we can make arrangements to make that material available. And the way that, for instance, uh, anyone can kind of request, you know, even if they can't go to come to AAA in person. Um, the way that someone can request from a library that maybe you know Xeroxes be sent or kind of you know of a, of a book or something like that that we can kind of work with them to make the material available. And you know the website is the on-site access is granted in Hong Kong, but also in our Delhi office and also in New York. So and there are a few other places. Uh, there's lots of them. Is there a specific category that? Um, specific archives uh, for weather or something to organize all the detail of uh, archiving, uh, like uh, like uh, the weather effect on the archive, ar archive material and how once you work. What's the last part? I missed the last part. The weather is affected the archive material, the dispatch reporter can actually get that. Yeah. So how you work that? Oh, okay. Well, so yes, weather is a very important kind of factor in climate. Um, a lot of the climate in Asia is not great for archival material. It's just kind of, you know, it's, it's, it can be very humid, it can be hot, it can, you know, it's not good for photographs, it's not good for audiovisual material. Um, and so what that means is sometimes things just are not uh, uh, conservable. Um, so in the case of one collection that we're working on, uh, which is from a Hong Kong artist named Kao Bik Chen, he took thousands and thousands and thousands of photographs. And he was very meticulous in that he saved those photographs, he saved the negatives. But because they were stored in his studio, uh, and you know there were many hot summers and hot springs and hot falls and whatever. Um, over the decades, the, the negatives um, had uh, vinegar syndrome, and so sometimes the, the the negatives literally kind of fuse into the block, and then there's nothing you can do about that. You can't. I mean, you can try to get a conserver to you know kind of separate. But because in this case it's not clear that the material is you know, high enough value or kind of important enough, it would just be so costly to do that for every single instance of it that we you know, have basically are storing the material, but eventually we're just going to have to dispose of it because you know, I don't think there's anyone who's going to be able to properly conserve that. So that's you know, a kind of an unfortunate instance where weather can be a kind of a, you know, do permanent damage to a collection. But on the plus side, there's often times when conservation work can be done, and in those cases, I think you know um, uh, we we do uh, do conservation work and then digitize the material. The good thing about digitizing the material is that once you do it, then at least you have a record of what it was like at the time that it was digitized, and then you can kind of you know hopefully migrate that indefinitely so that you preserve a record of that, right? even if the the physical material itself is going to continue to deteriorate. Um, there's other ways you can kind of slow that down. You can do climate control. So the vault spaces that we had that I showed at the beginning of the presentation, there are you know, humidity controlled, climate controlled, so that you know, it slows the, the, any possible damage down. Yeah. You're, you're increasingly focusing on digitization. Uh, we are focused primarily on digitization, except in cases where um, the keeping of the physical archive really um, is not uh, and is a is mandatory. Yeah. Uh, John, I have a question for you. Uh, yeah. you, you uh, almost hinted just now that the, with the big data that you've generated, uh, the statistical possibility that someone could really use that for advocacy so at work. And I think in a previous uh, panel that uh, involved in uh, one of your co-leader actions, I uh, showed some possibility and talked about saying, for example, the agenda sort of like ratio. Uh, we really sort of like then sort of use that to advocate for say more representation of sort of like women yeah. in the exhibition mm -hmm. and stuff like that. 
Yeah, uh, given that you're also the memory archive, and given that the question of sort of like gender identity is a lot more complicated now, and yeah. there are also uh, people who identify themselves as sort of like non binary and many other yeah. sort of platforms of gender, how, how is that worked into the way you sort of like tabulate the statistics and data, and how, how is I mean, the archive technically sort of like you know, bringing in a much more representative and inclusive way of doing that the ways of sort of trying to identify? Yeah. Okay, so that is a very thorny question, uh, which uh, has a, a rather, maybe a simple question, which is that um, that project was undertaken um, not long after I joined ADR Archive towards the end of 2017, uh, because uh, what happened was we did a project with the Gorilla Girls looking at the statistics for women artists working in Hong Kong and in Asia, East Asia more broadly. And also in Art Basel, because um, this was a project that was timed to kind of you know uh, go with Art Basel Hong Kong, and they came up with state scaling statistics for you know for all the institutions like Art Basel was basically you know like basically all surprise a sausage party right um, not a big you know I mean I think the only people who were scandalized by that really was Art Basel itself of like we we're not really like that we this, these statistics are wrong but you know it, it was really uncontrovertible like there was no arguing with that. Um, but they also did studies of other institutions and we invited them to look at ourselves at AAA. And so one of the things that came out of it was that of the, uh, for the research collections of the archives, we had something like you know, five to 10% of the collections were specifically from women donors. And so that was a very low amount. And I think people didn't expect that. I think you know, people probably knew that somewhere, but they didn't really you know, realize that in those hard number of facts uh, way. And so, you know, then that kind of triggered this idea, well, what percentage of the library is devoted to women artists as opposed to male artists? And I think it came from, um, it came from a, a well-meaning place of like, oh, well, we want to know, like, you know, maybe we need to really focus on getting more resources devoted to women artists. But at the same time, I think uh, some of what you mentioned is like, you know, very tricky in terms of there are artists who do not identify um, as being either male or female. There are artists who, you know, um, resist that kind of categorization by choosing a gender maybe that other than what other people think they are. Um, and so that's a very thorny question. And I think there are reasons why um, libraries um, have, sometimes resist those, using those kinds of identifications because, you know, um, artists themselves tend to kind of resist at least some kinds of artists resist those kinds of identifications because they want to be artists. They don't want to be male artists. They don't want to be, you know, they don't want to be like Asian American artists. They just want to be artists, right? And so I think that that project was undertaken kind of as an initial study um, to kind of genderize. That's the actual website. There's a website you can, you know, put in a name and genderize, like, you know, find out the gender. Obviously, that is a completely Western-centric website because you know you try taking like a you know like an East Asian name and figure out like what the gender is not it's not going to happen. And even with the Gorilla Girls project, like when we were doing that, um, you know, figuring out the the gender of the artists who were showing in our puzzle, it wasn't just like putting it into a machine and then getting out. I had to like work with them and go through the entire list of. First of all, I had to hunt down the list of all the artists that were showing in our puzzle, which is not as easy as it sounds. And then you have to go through and actually like, you know, like find out like, you know, oh, well, this artist like is this or this is that, you know. Um, and so after the initial study of genderize, you know, the library collections, we stopped because it was kind of considered too complicated, but also just too fraught um, in terms of, you know, like why should an organization have the authority to assign identification? It might change too, you know, the artists will kind of go back and forth and then when you do, you constantly have to update that information. Um, no part. Do you have anything you'd like to say? I don't know. <laughs> well, um, I, I have. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, I had a very interesting experience because I crossed over to Southeast Asia, <coughs> beginning in Japan, landing in Thailand, yeah. and working with two different uh, groups of artists who 
actually initiated these projects themselves. Yeah. Um, and uh, for me, it was um, it was I had a sense of relief. I could say what I wanted to say, which I couldn't necessarily say here right, in this environment. Uh, but I also recognize then the limitations of how others view myself yeah. or what I'm trying to say. And um, I like the fraternity we formed as women. You know, we work year after year with each other, uh, trying to develop ideas, trying to raise money to run the projects, um, living in different parts of the world, yet communicating rather well. So that for me was a very happy experience which I carried to this day. Uh, in fact, I was in Bangkok last year when they had that seminar there, wondering what to do with the Women Manifesto Archives after all the uh, Nabil social installation had had a publication, which I was also part of. And um, we are bringing, we are going to do it again. You know, Nifaya has a, a large piece of land now, yeah. and we are going to recommence. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, although there was a period where we didn't have anything going on, mm -hmm. in, in, in spite of communicating with each other, we didn't have the funds, we didn't have whatever, yeah. with different reasons. So I think this is. The continuation of it is so interesting. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we combined different generations of artists and we kept people of opening it up mm -hmm. to different ways of thinking and genders as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that we went work very deeply involved with communities over there, mm -hmm. working with their traditions, their crafts, mm -hmm. their politics, that was the most interesting aspect of it. As you've already remarked, mm -hmm. it wasn't about presenting an object. I mean, I was on a project where it was decided we want, if we didn't want to do anything, we didn't do anything. And I certainly didn't produce a piece. Yeah. You know, I walked all over the place, went swimming in the river, mm -hmm. uh, got my, I, I had this introduction into this <coughs> rural community, mm -hmm. living with it, eating with it. Yeah. Desperation when we couldn't get a, a piece of bread and uh, coffee in the morning instead of their locally, mm -hmm. local breakfast, you know, which yeah. was beginning to tell us as well. Mm -hmm. Discovering the flora and the fauna, and yeah. generally, you know, being women together. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there were these wonderful, wonderful, deep relationships that we still maintain. Mm -hmm. yeah. and can I ask, because one of the things that I've been wondering about is, I mean, to what degree, because you're an artist, you know, I think you are to, a large extent of diaspora artists, and you, you've you've lived here in Pakistan, but you've also lived in the UK. You've lived in Dubai, um, and you've also had significant kind of um, experiences in within Asia itself. So in Thailand, but also in Japan, um, and, and Afghanistan, and, and in Bangladesh. Yeah, and yeah, and the, at the summit. And I was wondering to what extent, like you know, like the experience of being a kind of a diaspora artist within Asia itself is different from being a diaspora artist in, you know, in say Dubai or in in the UK. Like, what does it mean to be an artist like representing Pakistan and Thailand as opposed to being an artist representing Pakistan in the UK? You know? Yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, it becomes. Um where you live, uh, you know, this kind of migrant status also takes, uh, takes uh, becomes part of you. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's um, a kind of, dis it's disparate, you're, you're, you're fragmented. Mm -hmm. You're no more one person yeah. or one identity. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, even though in my instance, I've done a lot of research on this region and worked mm -hmm. substantially um, do I represent myself or do I represent a country yeah. uh, or uh, a continent? Mm -hmm. That's a very difficult question to answer. Yeah. I, I'm fragmented now. Mm -hmm. And I know that there are voices that have appeared in me because I've had these opportunities to live in these different places, mm -hmm. whether it was for my research to further my understanding mm -hmm. of these, this region mm -hmm. and uh, the fact that I could when I lived in very hard spaces, I could remove myself from them and go back.